Last Pine Productions presents the New Way Podcast with Ben and Matt. The New Way Podcast contains adult content, including KY Wrestling, Artsy Fartsy Movies, and Rambling. Listener discretion is advised. So listen, here's the deal. This is what we should do. You should get off the train with me here in Vienna and come check out the town. What? Come on, that'll be fine. <laughs> what did we do? In Japan, men always come first. Women come second. I might just retire to here. How did you know it was an ambush? Whenever there is any doubt, there is no doubt. First time in L.A.? Yeah. Tell you the truth, whenever I'm here, I can't wait to leave. Everybody wants to be naked and famous. Everybody wants to be just like me. Naked. Will you help teach me about this? What is it? A new way? Welcome once again to the New Way Podcast with Ben and Matt. Thank you, William Shatner. <laughs> Welcome, once again, what? to the New Way Podcast. Uh, she, I don't know if you know this, uh, Matt, but she packed my bags last night, <laughs> pre-flight. Pre-flight? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I uh, hope everyone's been doing well. I was absent a week ago because... Uh, Matt was, Matt was too busy uh, gallivanting around uh, Texas, which is actually kind of the fun way I wanted to start this podcast, because I wanted a short <laughs> recap. In case you haven't listened to last week's podcast, it was with a couple of very interesting people um, who Hoot has the, the wonderful distinction of calling family. Uh, you just called me Hoot. I called you Hoot? You just called me, you said who Hoot has the distinction of calling family. As if I were Hoot, and I went to Texas. I, I said, with whom? Oh! Uh, I was about to say, I was like, I said, with, or, or, with, or to whom, Matt. Uh, That's, I, I think I, think okay. I misunderstood That's it. a little confused. But anyways, uh, there was some interesting stuff on there uh, with, uh, <laughs> with, with some of Matt's family. Um, and, and Hoot, you know... Listening to the story, if you have it, it's really great. The fact that he was in a Terrence Mount Terry, 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 Terry and, and Ryan, <laughs> and Ryan Gosling, who he's apparently the best friends and wants to barbecue with now. I, I seriously like if there is any sort of Make a Wish Foundation or something where I can make this happen to like just video a uh, film Ryan Gosling and Hoot for like an hour just an hour that's all I need I, I want this to happen it's amazing that would be pretty awesome but anyways I wanted to know so uh, explain what was your uh, what were the highlights of your Texas trip Matt uh, well, besides interviewing <laughs> Hoot and your mother <laughs> Um, I had a good time. I, I went to Austin for the first time, which was like hipster, like the mecca of all hipster locations. I thought LA was like Silver Lake area was pretty hipsterish, and Chicago they pale in comparison to the twirly mustachioed hipsters uh, and stoned hipsters of Austin, Texas. Have you spent much time in Denver or in Boulder? I've, or I've in... heard Denver and I've heard San Fran as well. well. Portland is the Port- Portland, I think, is the golden pinnacle of the U.S. of hipster, hipsterific. I was, I was very surprised. It was just like, it, like, it, well, and the other things that I'd kind of like scouted places, I scouted locations to go to before I went out there, and um, most of the places were like really good eateries, good places for beer. So like, I go in there and it's like just a bunch of dudes in capris and the little shoes without the socks in it and. Everyone's, like, Instagramming their food, which, of course, I had to Instagram my food as well. So it's just, like, it was... Matt, you need to learn how to use Instagram, by the way. No, no, no. I wanted to Instagram everything that I did in Texas. But because I get yelled did, at for not using Instagram. Just, just in case you know, there was a series <laughs> of, like, 24 straight photos taken, like, in rapid succession, like, one minute after another, of some women... I guess that was a KY wrestling or what was it? Yes, it was a lube wrestling event with derby roller derby girls. Beth, Beth was like, what, "Is that Jello?" I was like, no. "That is lube." That, I, I, I believe me, I know lube if, wrestling. If, <laughs> if you'd followed my entire Instagram story, you would have seen them making the lube and making the vor- they're very When they make the lube, <laughs> it is the do-it-yourself state. This is. It was a very the best part is it was very specific instructions on the lube so they get this huge like tub that's filled with water and then you had to create a vortex 
in the water and mix, put the lube mix in, and then, like, continue, like, making the vortex of the lube. It was the weirdest thing of it. It was like watching a birth. What was the consistency of the lube? Awful, and it got in my ear, and I couldn't... I don't even want to know how that happened. I'm pretty sure I still have some in my ear. I'm not positive, but it took... (laughs) I spent, like, a good 20 minutes in the bathroom trying... Oh, this is a good story (laughs) for all you out there. So after the the lube uh, wrestling, which I was involved in but couldn't take any pictures because it's very luby, and then just wound up being like, it was like that episode of South Park with the pile. It was just like a group of ten people in a kiddie pool filled with make your own lube. Now, that sounds wrong, but um, <laughs> so so I get out and I go to like shower off my myself and I. <laughs> I go into the bathroom, I shower, and I get out, and I can't get the door back open, at, like, from the bathroom into to the bedroom. Because your, your hand was still <laughs> I wish it was that. It was just the door, like, like, like I can just imagine you, like, I can't, I can't do I, it. I can't do it. I got loop all over my hand. It's so hand. slippery. I like something out of an American Pie movie. You're like, oh, it's so slippery. It did turn into sort of American pie so... So I the door like slid over and I just I couldn't get it to to work right and there's someone clearly in the room that I don't know and I'm like hi um I I don't have any clothes on and my clothes are in the room you're in and I'm afraid I can't get the door open so then it turns into like a there's something about Mary scene with like five people trying to open the door with me like with all I had was like a, all the towels had been used outside so I had like a like a a, a floor mat that I've got like sort of draped in front of my parts very like Greek god-esque and I'm just in there and like and there's all these people on the other side of the door that can see in and I'm just like I'm so I'm so sorry I'm so sorry everyone I really wish you didn't have to be like no it's okay we're all friends it was just really really was this awkward. in somebody's house yeah it was at uh, my friend Alex's house <laughs> oh man <laughs> it was a long night that <laughs> ended with fried Oreos uh, which are ridiculous but Anyway. Is that really what it ended with, or was there other things it was ended with? It ended with fried Oreos. I don't know what you're implying, Ben, but I don't appreciate it. And there are names that have now been mentioned, so we can't... Uh, uh, we'll leave you for once not knowing every intimate secret of my entire life. Even though uh, Ben would be happier if I just... Whatever. Uh, I just told you I wrestled in, in, in lube, and, I, and a bunch of people saw me half naked. Is this not enough... Are you not entertained? I, I'm not entertained. <laughs> I need more. More. <laughs> Anyways, no, uh, that, that sounds like a fun time. Anyways, it was good. Well, Th- and thank you to uh, Alex out in Texas and her friends and the good people of Austin and Hoot and my mom. And uh, make sure to stay tuned next week for the other half of the Bandera excursion. Yeah, we'll have... Uh, my mom and hoot, and my my appearance on Bandera Radio that happened. That was going to be my next plug, basically. Uh, I yes. wanted to seg that into then that. If you liked what you heard last week, there's more where that came from. Lots more, more, more. more. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, it should be should be a fun time, uh, fun thing to listen to. I'm excited about listening to it because, well. After seeing the, it, like, cause I was like, you broke Instagram. You don't, you take like one photo and then you, you post that photo and you, you pick the best photo and you, you Instagram that. Now, even no. like the Instagram whores that I know do it like 10 times a day. They're taking pictures of, you know, whatever. But no, this was like rapid succession. I'm like a super whore. Bad, bad photos. Like, yes. like blurry, bad of people yes. rolling around. And I, was I, like, I, yeah. I may have been drinking beer since like three o'clock that afternoon, so I'm sorry I broke it like Instagram been, it looked, etiquette. It looked like you had been drinking beer since three o'clock that morning. <laughs> it may have, <laughs> may have been that way. <laughs> when in Texas, that's right. No, but that was that, that was pretty awesome. So, anyways, well, we're happy that that Matt is back. But yeah, <laughs> that I lived to tell the tale. Yeah, you, you did live to tell tell the tale while I get to got to sit back here and move or get ready to move and you know close on the house and do all of that fun adult stuff. You like to move it. Uh, yeah. That's right. I, I did it. I right. said it. <laughs> <laughs> I went there and I killed it. Uh, yeah, Ben, congratulations. Ben is, even though we congratulated him on this before, but then he said it could fall through, Ben is a homeowner. I'm officially a homeowner now, which is really awesome. So, yeah, it, it's about time. So, anyways, uh, to sort of a, a complete non sequitur, I did have kind of a strange topic to talk about 
about this week that I kind of proposed to Matt. Um, lube wrestling in <laughs> film. It's going to be lube wrestling. Chronicling it through the ages. Well, I mean, I think we have stripes and that's it. <laughs> from, we have stripes and we have uh, no, old school. From the from the early Chaplin films, some of the lost films that people don't know about, the silent lube wrestling films. Ah, uh, yes. Yes, yes. Yeah. I got into talkies. Chaplin was very into that. <laughs> So why his hair was always so greased back but, and lovely. Uh, it was all it was lube. <laughs> um, Leftovers. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I had kind of the, a fun thing because I was I was watching a, uh, some trailers for some films that were coming out later this summer and or later this year. Some independent films from earlier, and I got to thinking about the the impact or the uh, the the importance of. Not the look of the film is in the cinematography, which we might get to some point down the road. I'm really into cinematography. I really like the look. I like the design of films. However, in a lot of cases, and especially sort of from an early age, really more into the kind of talky era, era, uh, era funny enough, or really into the color era, I think is even more important. The location in which a film takes place is of great importance. And I don't mean like, oh, it happens in New York, so or oh, it happens in Prague, or oh, it happens in Reykjavik, Iceland, and that's the reason why it's this type of film. Obviously, the film can be a, a, whatever type of film it wants to be. However, there are certain types of films and that where the, the actual location, the locale, becomes a character unto itself. And the... I mean, I, I can throw out some that I don't even really want to talk about that much, where it's like, obviously, if you think Lawrence of Arabia, you have that very specific view of what was shot in Tunisia and Egypt. Yeah. And you know what that that look looked like. And it becomes a character in the film, with, especially with all of the long long lens, you know... Uh, uh, well, and it's and it's that stranger in a strange mir- land tale, mirage so stuff, it sort of, really yeah, feeds exactly. into the story. So everything kind of builds into it. And so I kind of find it interesting as an inter- interesting topic to kind of talk about the role that the location of the film and, and sort of these where, where the especially where films are utilizing the location in which they film as a character or as something to motivate that film further along because when at the beginning of film when we were talking about sounds everything was shot on a sound stage I mean they they didn't do anything outside of essentially closed doors. They they built sets. The stuff that they were shooting outside, A, they didn't know how to control the elements yeah. as well. So they, they didn't have the ability to do what they did now. Um, but you can even see it from the very some of the very first uh, experiments in film. I know that, uh, and I, I believe it was uh, uh, Milton had the did the 15 seconds short of the train moving towards the yeah the and so obviously that had a huge impact on on people and that was outside you had no ge- geography really in any of that stuff and then as stories started to develop you had no real geography they were happening on sets it was yeah. happening in this very close <clears throat> sort of you know c- contained location well as film evolved people realized that you know, shooting on a soundstage had its place, whereas shooting on location or in a place where they can literally make that that you know area a a, a part of what's going on uh, it can actually add to the movie, add to the narrative, actually turn it into something different. I'll throw out a very kind of weird, j- just the sort of thing, so you understand sort of the context that I'm talking about in Midnight Cowboy. Uh, John Voight and and uh, Dustin Hoffman are walking down the street, and there's that very famous yeah. line: "I'm talk- I'm walking here. I'm walking here. I'm talking here." I'm wa- <laughs> which, should, which should be our new line. I, our, our new. I think we should just always uh, like completely flub famous movie lines. Right. Exactly. <laughs> I'm walking here. Well, that was an improvised I'm line. Here. That was an improvised line that happened because they didn't close down traffic, and so somebody cut across. And nearly hit the actors that were being filmed. The, some of the extras in that scene didn't realize they were extras. Like the same thing I was talking about, like Roger Dodger. That you're giving New York character. There. Yeah, you're you're turning it into a place that has this life unto itself, basically. And, and it, it it not only affects like the actual uh, narrative of the movie, but the characterizations of the people who are acting in the movie obviously change as well as being a part of this larger machine or this larger yeah, thing yeah. that's kind of this, and so there there are multiple ways to look at it and i the one of the reasons why i thought it was interesting is cuz i feel like 
the thing that made me think about it was that every time I'm seeing like these ads for like Fast and the Furious or yeah. these very slick like action thrillers, they've gotten to this point where there's this sort of reliance on moving them to these very, very specific they're locales. They're jet-setting movies. They're jet-setting movies. Where they're like, <clears throat> they had this huge segment ha- taking place in Rio de Janeiro. Or they had this huge part taking place in Mexico City. Or they had this part taking place in Tokyo or whatever. And they're, they, they're building the city or that location as a character. Yeah. I, I mean, in the, in the events of the movie or the chronology of the movie. And I was like, it's just so funny because at this point they're like... I don't think you can make a movie like The Italian Job and be like, no, it's just set in L.A. <laughs> yeah, like, where's the second set piece? Yeah, location? exactly. We're <laughs> like, I mean, but it, it's funny because you have all of these very accomplished filmmakers, guys like Christopher Nolan. I mean, like, you look at a thing like Inception. Inception's all over the place. I mean, even, it's like, well, even the Batman movies are in all over uh, in, the place, and they're in like this universe where all of these places are like within. Uh, like an hour's flight from yeah, exactly <laughs> from and, Gotham. And, yeah, or the Bourne movies. I mean, it, it's just this like with the, that action thriller thing. It's become one of the new things to do. Is like, oh, we have to have these very specific and brilliant locations so we can have this play into a part of the movie. Now, the funny thing is, is some movies I feel like it's just kind of superfluous. Like they do it yeah. just because it's like, oh, it'd be great to have you know this city here and this scene, but it's either so brief it doesn't even fucking matter. Yeah. Or it it they don't understand the character of that city, so there's they're, they're basically just doing it to show like a shot of the Sydney Opera House, yeah, yes, or exactly. a shot of this famous building. Or they're doing it because then... they're like, oh, they have these really narrow streets, and we're going to do this thing. But meanwhile, it has nothing to do with the actual yeah. part of the movie. Uh, me, well, then again, you have other films where they really do work on the identity of the places that they're shooting at. And that obviously adds to the to what it is that they're doing or what it is that the, the filmmakers are trying to get across. Um, which I'll get into that because, like I said, I, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself because one of the last things I want to touch on as far as the jet setting thing is concerned is sort of the James Bondish thing. Bond really kind of set the precedent, I, I think, for that type of action movie or for the type of movie where you're really hopping around in these specific locations where you're showing trying to show off the beauty. And, well, and, and, that, and that's also kind of just due to the character that if you watch, like, you look at that evolution of film, there weren't characters that had this, the means or the reason to be in all of these different locations in a single story. Right. And Bond was one of the first ones where, like, well, he's got expendable income from the government, you right. know, the Secret Ser- Her Majesty's Secret Service, and it makes sense for him to have to be going globetrotting to find these villains and fight these people. Sure, sure, absolutely. Um, but anyways, what I kind of wanted to talk about was some of the first, at least, was some of the early films that I felt like really sort of set a, a, a landscape where it became... It, it, it obviously added something to the film for them to shoot, to actually go on location, because that was another thing, especially in the early days of film. They went to gr- much greater expense because they were like, well, we can shoot this on a small soundstage. We can get you know all these actors yeah. in there. We can shuttle in there. We'll, we'll build everything up. Uh, if we have to go out, we have to do it, this sort of thing. And then uh, you know, when everything permitting came along and all sorts well, of Well, they were always – those were also those – a lot of those movies where they're dealing with like 300 extras, whereas nowadays they can CGI in everyone but the principal Well, cast. yeah, but even then, it, uh, like I said, uh, uh, there are lots of films where the extras don't even realize that they're being in something until they're forced yeah, to sign a release. Yeah, that's in the 70s, but not in those, those – Still like, nowadays they do it. Like I said – Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, the, they did it in – that was – I was telling you about in, uh, in Being John Malkovich that they had this one poor PA – on set that they send around the corner <clears throat> they're like we don't have the permit make sure that if anyone comes through here that, that you like give us a heads up or you keep them from coming through here did you know that I, I hope I'm not misstating this but that the scene in being John Malkovich where the guy drives by and throws the can out the window they say was not supposed to happen I, I kept reading that and then I watched the making of and they show it completely happening rehearsed like they have the guy in the car stopped Okay. And then he goes, what they got was that he wasn't supposed to hit him so squarely, and it was like that perfect, like ah, they had one okay, take, okay. that he drove by and he threw the can and like nailed Malkovich I mean, to the back of the head. They were talking about extras, so yeah. obviously that, that we're not going off on that so much. But what I kind of wanted to, to sort of start off on was what's considered as the golden standard of the beginning of real cinema is Birth of a Nation. And Birth of a Nation was a film where... 
the filmmakers decided basically to throw every expense at going everywhere they wanted to shoot. They shot a lot outdoors uh, in uncontrolled lighting situations and essentially made this, you know, pre, uh, you know, pre sound, pre speaking epic that was shot all over, literally all over the country um, at great expense. And then, of course, it was ended up, ended up being at the time one of the most successful and popular, you know, uh, films of its era. So then it led to in the 30s and 40s, you began having these much more audacious directors like your Wellses and mm-hmm. your uh, and it, not so much even like some of the guys I really like your Fords and your Capras were still very much, um, you know, they they kind of stuck to their own th- thing. They didn't do too much that was outside of the box until really the the early development of the Western in the late 30s yeah. and early 40s. Your Cowboys and Indians pieces became what is now more equivocated to the modern Western, which is the loner of walking through the desert. And I... I, I could, anti-hero. It, it could have been Ford. It could have been... Uh, I mean, the, I could accredit it to plenty yeah. uh, of, of directors who kind of took that stuff because so many were doing it at the same time. Because that was the first real recognizable place where it's like we're shooting this outside in an expansive desert where you can't see anything in any direction and you have this lone hero or this these people on horses walking in one direction or another and i think that one of the reasons why the western was so popular then and is less popular now is because at that time in cinema it gave viewers something different from yeah, people saw an actual outdoor shot versus a map painting exactly, and, a, uh, and an obvious exactly. set. No, no, exactly, and it was a different type of filmmaking, and it was it was more exciting, uh, and, and it, stylistically, it added to. I mean, because it created a whole subgenre with the antihero and the things that you're talking about there, which I, I feel like it, it, some of it is actually stems from just that initial feeling that you get of these locations and the and these experience reserves, and then of course when you had color come around. Color out of a whole new element. Um, even before, and I was going to say, the, the other direction or the, the films like Casablanca that began to kind of do the exact same thing. But even if you look at a film like Casablanca, it's set in these very, very specific locations that are very exotic. Yeah. However, it still feels kind of camp. It's very still, much so. It still feels like it's a... Um, <laughs> Do you think if like like I'm I just like imagine an alternate universe where um where like <clears throat> the movie hub isn't somewhere near a desert? I mean, part of why the westerns worked is that they all they had to do was go an hour outside of right, town exactly. and they could hit it. But like, imagine if it was like if the epicenter of film was like Oregon and like every movie was just Jeremiah Johnston. Like there was a there's like a whole subgenre of mountain man movies that became the cowboys and yeah, you and never know. And, I mean, it would be funny because that. That could happen. That could have happened, you know, if it hadn't have been L.A. There's a poor universe out there where, like, they don't they don't know what a cowboy movie is if or an Indian if movie. We're, if we're talking about quantum <laughs> physics, yeah, exactly. Like, everything. But the first, like, instead of King Kong, it was Paul Bunyan. Are, are you talking about the man and bear movies? Yeah, we've seen a lot of those. <laughs> <laughs> that was totally Canadian. It was Pacific Northwest area has some similar Canadian... Listen, uh, uh, I've been watching okay. a lot of TV shows shot in or around Canada, and I've been developing a Canadian accent. Again. Okay, sounds good. You come <laughs> back from Texas and you talk like a Canadian. It's the only way to com- combat the Texas accent. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. No, but, uh, but yeah, it is kind of funny that that, that could have been... I mean, it had it been something different like that, I feel like that it, with the natural progression that films took, it could have gone a completely different direction. I, I mean, obviously certain people... Uh, uh, identify with the themes of westerns, but I'm just saying that I think that that kind of kickstarted the whole. I mean, even if you look at movies like Lawrence of Arabia, like I said, yeah. I hate using it as an example, but it's just a perfect thing where the 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 everything is set up by the location. So then you had this kind of new wave of film kind of come after that, where people realized, you know, oh wow. Like, shit, we can shoot in these locations and we can actually give it some extra flavor. Like, we yeah. can do this in cities. And and one of the reasons why, I again, I think that the in the 50s and 60s, the French New Wave became popular is because you were seeing locations that you didn't see before. And you were shooting a lot outside and you were shooting a lot of handheld. It was a different look. Yeah. But inadvertently, it also gave these cities like Paris and cities like... Uh, um, 
you know, Milan, places where they were shooting films, a lot of uh, an identifiable flavor. Where well, an exposure. I mean, you got to figure that uh, that the average person going to the movies at this time has ne- they've you, you don't have as much access to like there's no internet. Your library system isn't maybe like you don't have a lot of travel logs. You don't have television. So these movies are probably you know that and I, I imagine that somewhat dictated what we consider to be those tropes of films that identify like these cities and these areas abroad for people that never people never seen France so the Eiffel Tower becomes the one thing that like you show right, in exactly. three movies uh, well, and then people it was know it was the same thing for foreigners who were seeing movies from from the US they would watch King Kong and yeah. then all of a sudden <laughs> New York is its own is its own thing or really the Empire State Building is its own thing yeah. that movie has no identifiable New York stuff besides basically King Kong <laughs> and then they got to North by Northwest and got really they thought that the Mount Rushmore was way bigger <laughs> well actually I, right. <laughs> I was actually going to bring in because I think that uh, that Hitchcock was one of the ones who realized that this sort of empty Space thing can not only work in the context of a Western, but can work in small town America. Yeah, with your Norman Bates and Psycho, which well, he does, in, and, and with the birds, with, 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 you know. And I love like how much he mixed and matched oh, sure. all of that. Where you're that you're on you're on a location, and then you're on a soundstage on the next shot for the things that require more technical, with things you have to have more control no, over, he, and then you're back outside. He was again. a wizard. He was a wizard. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that, and that was one of the... You're a wizard, Hitchcock. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. I want to see that meeting. <laughs> Hagrid um, coming Ingrid. up to Hitchcock. <laughs> and <laughs> Ingledorf. You're making Ingrid and Ingledorf. <laughs> Sorry, that was Hoot. It's called the callback. That, that, that was the. Hoot if song. you didn't get that, you should be listening to these in order and listen to all of our podcasts. We'll we'll tell you where to find that, it. That, at the end that, of this. that was the hoot. <laughs> but uh, but anyways, it's it, he was very smart about the way that he was using location. Um, and a, a movie that I previously referenced as well uh, in, a, in an earlier podcast, which is All Quiet on the Western Front, which was you know uh, late thirties, early forties. That was another film. Uh, Dr. Zavago, though, was one of the films in the that really took it to the next level in the 60s. Uh, even Bridge before, on the River Kwai. Even, it, well, Bridge on the River Kwai is 55. That's, you know, that, that's one of the gold standards. Yeah. But so many of these films started really, you know, uh, utilizing this sort of on-site uh, thing. And, and I think that's the reason why that type of film became popularized at that point. Now... There obviously has been sort of this uh, synthesis of films that have utilized the location, kind of I was mentioning some earlier, as sort of a character. Um, Apocalypse Now is one where they were adamant about shooting on location, and mm-hmm. it was a very it was a, a very challenging shoot, and uh, but one of the most brilliant films ever made. Uh, so, so that and that's that's continued to happen. Woody Allen created a very strong New York identity, as did Scorsese, um, where they're 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 use, using no real sets. They're shooting on location. They're shooting practically. Mm-hmm. They're shooting with natural light and, and real thing. You know, real people sometimes in the background, and they're letting the city or <laughs> the town or the area in which they shoot become sort of that extra character. Lynch went on to do it later. The one, the one that I loved that uh, was the first one that popped in my head when you mentioned this idea was Michael Mann in L.A. Because most <laughs> yeah. most people shoot L.A. or Hollywood in this like glamorized, glitzy thing, and Mann always just like finds the grimiest, like scummiest. Like every time you watch a Michael Mann movie set in L.A., whether it's a Heat or Collateral or uh, any of these movies, the Collateral is the one that really like sold it for me. I don't know why, but it was one of those where it's just like, God, L.A. just looks so bad in, right. in, sure. in this. Well, in this L.A.'s movie. not a pretty city if you've ever no, been there before. No. I mean, it's really, I mean, the way that L.A. is depicted in movies is, I mean, it, it's unfair, I guess, to depict it in the way that it actually exists, which is a pretty shitty town. Like, even <laughs> movies where they're making fun of L.A., where they're making fun of the culture, L.A. still looks good. I mean, it's like in The Player. Yeah. L.A. still looks good. 
And Kiss Kiss, kiss, bang, kiss bang, bang Bang LA still looks good I'm like I, This looks like a place I would hang out And like want to go And then you go to LA And you're like Shit oh, This is awful This is not what I wanted I'm like Oh I'm, I'm like in Four square blocks Of Santa Monica That I like And then I walk into Like a area one block south of that and I get mocked. That's what's funny is that, you know, and we, we were kind of going to be going all over, I think on this and the, some sure. of the things well, I talked I was going to bring it back to another thing in a minute, but go, yeah. you want to do it and then we'll, I'll get over to what I was talking about. No, no, I want you to go. Um, what's interesting are the, the, like having just come from Texas and Austin is this, has become kind of this film, like mini epicenter in the, in the center of the country. But what's funny to me is, unless it's a film specifically about, like, a a true Texas character, a lot of those Texas filmmakers don't, their movies don't have Texas flavor. They're very good. Like, Linklater, other than Bernie, which is set in In North Texas, Texas, um, you know, like, uh, 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 Days and Confused doesn't feel like, other than the football thing, and it doesn't feel Days like Days and Confused Texas. feels like an Iowa movie. Yeah, too. exactly. Like, And it's funny, that's the one state that, that, and you've got, you know, you've got uh, uh, Rodriguez, and you've got all these people out there, and none of their movies are, re- they're, they love Texas, and they love Austin, and they want to talk about all these great things, but they they don't really have any of the flavor of those those locales in their movies, which I think is kind of interesting to me. Versus somebody like Kevin Smith, who it, you know has a Jersey trilogy or a quadrilogy, right. depending on how exactly. you look at it, where it, Jersey is a character in his movie that kind of. Well, here's out. the only thing: I I don't even think Jersey became Jersey's a character in Chasing Amy. Yeah, Amy. it's very much a character in Chasing Amy. Um, I don't really consider Clerks that much of a geographical movie. With I don't consider Mallrats that much of a geographical movie. I think Mallrats kind of less so. Clerks, I think you can argue Clerks a little is, bit with the, the could, accents and the. It oh, feels Jersey. The yeah, it feels but Jersey-ish to me. I, I don't know. I still think that that there is there's something about that those first two films that make them a little bit more sort of interchangeable with anywhere else in America. Obviously, I, I'm, I'm just saying. I think Chasing Chasing Amy is sort of his. Besides Jersey Girl, yeah, but even but even Chasing Amy has a better it identifies Jersey better than Jersey Girl does. Jersey Girl just, just wants to make weird. a punchline out of it, which is always in, uh, odd. Yeah, to it's me. not even a punchline. It's just like it's it's such a it's a weird misidentity almost. I feel like that, that's in Jersey Girl. But, but there's like a big argument between the city between New York and Jersey in that movie that there's this like right. Well, it's, like, it's, big it's it feels like it feels like Kevin Smith is kind of like saying it's like he's being defensive about New Jersey a little bit. Like, yeah, like, yeah. Like, it almost feels like. Oh, New Jersey really isn't that bad, and you know. Yet he's still making fun of it on most of the Jersey stuff. Yeah, it's I odd. Just, it's I, an odd. Yeah, it is, it is really kind of bizarre. Uh, but Liv, um, Liv Tyler, very attractive woman. Just did you see the way. picture today? Uh, today they realized, uh, he Evangeline it. Lilly. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know why. I, I was like, that's what you're going to talk I was about. Like, I was like, uh, because you know me, <laughs> like Lord of the Rings stuff popping up. Evangeline Lilly in the Hobbit movie, looking like, like Zelda. Link. Uh, popped up, I was like, it's women, women in tights. <laughs> I was like, it Rob- really looked like Robin Hood. Robin Hobbit. <laughs> Robin Hobbit. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> A complete <laughs> departure from the topic. There. Well, you know what? Really quick, on a very quick aside, before we get back to to your thought, this does tie in to, and this is kind of a different, a, a, another tangent in this discussion. But Lord of the Rings is a great film, a great series to talk about as far as location shooting, hmm. where you don't have the identity of the location, but you use the the, the idea that the location isn't known. To create a foreign land. Well, and that that was that was kind of one of the last things I wanted okay. to get to. And, and I'll, 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 but to briefly, I, I don't even want to want to ponder anything too much before I even get there. The ponder away. No, I was going to say, like I said earlier, the James Bond films did something to cinema. They they created sort of that action, the the idea of sort of these action sequences happening in different places uh, that were. And I still feel like there's this really funny thing. That happens with Prague. Like, everyone's like, they're all, all these action movies. I feel like every time they, like, do this cutaway where the villain is in a, like, bar or in this, this club, and it's always in Prague. They did that in Alias a lot. Prague was, like, their go-to every exactly. season. You have to, you someone have, had a trip to Prague. Like, somebody has to go to Prague because that's where, like, ever, there are these clubs and all these amazing European women dancing around. 
and there's this drug deal or there's this thing going on or an exchange of money or a hitman is hired. And it's like, I've been to Prague, okay? Now, Prague's a very beautiful, like, historical city, but it's nothing like it's depicted in the movies. But it's a great name that people put a put a label on, like, and it's not Amsterdam, and it's not the Czech Republic, or formerly Czech Republic, or, you know, whatever, that's too much... Ma- former Czechoslovakia, current yeah, Czech it, it, Yeah, exactly. Like, it, that's just too much to say. It's easy to say Prague. I, right. As soon as you say Prague, I know exactly what I'm about to see in the scene. Exactly. You know exactly. <laughs> you, you, know, <laughs> you know that the microchip is about to be passed into the guy. And it's going to be slid jacket. across an ice bar uh, to yes. a girl on a fur coat that's inside there yes. working it. <laughs> yes, and you know that there's going to be steam in the air when they breathe. Uh, I can't wait to go to Prague. <laughs> <laughs> Next, Next, it's two not, podcasts from now, we'll be uh, we'll podcasting live from Prague. From so. Prague. <laughs> uh, where else did Brayden say that we should go? For, for, Thailand. <laughs> <laughs> One week from Prague, next week from Thailand. Sweet. Um, no, anyways, it, it just is really funny that they <laughs> they utilize places like that, but. The thing that, and that, so that's one direction that sort of this, this kind of jet setting sort of thing took, like we were talking about earlier. The, the natural progression, though, of the more uh, naturalistic approach to film, where you're letting that area or the, the locale play a part, but not in the way where it's like, oh, this is a place where this insidious activity is happening, or this is a place where uh, an action sequence needs to happen, or this is this and that. I think that that happened a lot, like I was saying, with sort of the naturalization of New York with Woody Allen, what I was talking about with Scorsese, well, and, the, and, and the man, whole, and that, the only Texas person to actually do that, to bring it all full circle, is Terrence Malick with uh, Badlands. Yes, well, yeah, Badlands One of the only people, still, he's from Austin, and he shot that somewhere in middle Texas, and that's very that's much a movie yeah. where you feel that location even though it's not there's nothing flash i mean there's the opposite of flashing right well uh but the funny thing is is then you had spielberg do movies like close encounters where you're i I believe that the geography of a movie like close encounters is very important to the way that that movie takes uh, unfolds Mm -hmm. and uh strangely enough in almost any spielberg movie i feel like i can see a still of that movie and have a sense of location in america yeah it it is this very sort of middle america sort of feeling movie and then more uh, spielberg was very good about kind of doing that as well uh, he had a very specific aesthetic for Jurassic Park. I know that was shot in Hawaii. And well, I mean, look at look at uh, E.T. E- e- and Poltergeist, which are pretty much take place right, in the same right, right, neighborhood. Right, right, right. Exactly. Just two different it's, sides yeah. of the story. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, he uh, shot the suburbs of California better than anyone. <laughs> well, right, right. Well, the only reason why I wouldn't uh, go there as much is because I feel like that was kind of being done by some of the more progressive directors in the 70s and stuff like that. I mean, with, you know... With your Cassavetes, and I mean that that sort of suburban turmoil was something that was yeah. being explored. I'm talking about more of the kind of the on-site location sort of stuff, where yeah. Spielberg was doing a lot of shooting outside uh, and doing lots of these sort of panoramic things, where they were he was letting these areas play vistas, the, yeah, the vistas and the beautiful locations kind of play into it. But it was a different type of movie than the vistas you would see in the westerns in the 50s and 60s. Um, and like I said, it wasn't being set up to, to it wasn't being shot to show us a plot point. It wasn't set, you know, to, to show a location that something's gonna happen. Um, which I think now is playing a, a, a very interesting part because we've moved I'd say in a good way, uh, or a good bit away, not in a good way, excuse me. A good bit away from that. Where nowadays the Films where you have an identifiable theme from a location or from a certain vista or from a certain, um, you know, a feeling that that you know permeates a location, they they're they're not they don't come around very often anymore yeah. to me. Uh, like you get a very you get a very specific sense of like Paris with Amelie. Yeah, but. Name another movie that you've seen in the last ten years that gives you like a very good specific feeling. Besides, a, you know, uh, Paris, I love you. You know, you should, uh, Paris. Yeah, you should and it was funny because I was I was kind of racking my brain because I know I've I've discussed it. Like, there's a lot of times when you're reviewing a movie, you're thinking about a movie, and you're like, oh, it was so cool because this bl- blank was like a, a character in the movie, and I feel like I've said that <laughs> in the last decade, but I couldn't like. 
I couldn't nail anything down specifically where I was just like, I, I remember now, like, why... I mean, Collateral was, I guess, like, that was 2006. It's, like, the most recent and, and, I can and, think and of. And that's, that's a great one. Because uh, like, that's the thing I really do feel like they're few and far between. But when they do come out, when the director handles it correctly, it ends up being very effective in the context of the movie. And it's funny. They're usually done nowadays because of CGI and because of your, you're able to... You can go around. You can sure, do all these crazy things. That... Um, so, you know, you have things like Transformers that are taking place in four different identifiable locations that are meant to be one. Same as the Dark Knight movies where you've got Gotham, which is really Chicago and New York and uh, and Mostly Pittsburgh. Chicago. Yeah, mostly Chicago. But even the first one, there was a lot of... Well, the last one, there was a lot of New York in it. But um, with those, it seems to be the ones that are done low budget tend to say, let's use these locations where... We have to be in this kind of one area, this one specific thing. Something like Collateral is low budget. It's shot on digital. It's it's kind of done. Wait, collateral wasn't shot digitally. The collateral was he he mm. put the grain in in the post production process. Well, it was one of the first. It was one of the first fully I'll digital. Back, I'll go back and look at that. <clears throat> I don't think for some reason to me, I didn't think that tw- that collateral was shot twenty four p. I know that his stuff since then. I know that Miami Vice collateral was his first. His his one that proved that you could do it. I'll I'll make you a bet on that. I know very few things on a technical level, but that's one of the ones that sticks out in my head because every. I remember when the reviews were coming out from the geeks. Everyone's watching it and they're going, "It looks." Grainy. It looks like film, it, but it. But well, there's what, dig, it, you well, can tell. Here's the thing. What it looked like. What, what it looked like was a single bleach bypass on a film that had been underexposed. That's what it looked like. I mean, it, 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 that's the the reason why. I mean, in Collateral was oh four, I believe. I thought that that was shot uh, thirty five millimeter. Uh, I mean, non anamorphic. Well, you go on to your next section. And I'll look it up here on my trusty phone. Well, I mean, I didn't really have because that was the thing. I was I was kind of trying to close out the whole the, because I was I was naming trying to think of some movies where you, you they are using locations and not as a plot point, but they're using it as a character. Yeah. And like I said, Woody Allen's one of my favorite directors and has been for a long time because he does it so well with the locations that he's shooting in. He was New York for the seventies and for the early eighties, and. Then in the nineties, it had this sort of weird switch to LA with a couple of films that he did. And then he just moved cities and done three or four films in every city since then. He did his I mean right now he's in you know, he's finishing up Rome basically. Yeah. <clears throat> but he's done Paris and he's done Barcelona. And all of the films really actually have some identifiable themes that go along with what's going on in the city. And I think that that's a very, it's a very specific conceit. It's a very, it's a very specific idea that he has as a director to make, to bring those cities to life. Now, some of it's too on the nose, like yeah. to Rome with love is way too on the nose, uh, for, I think anybody to really appreciate what the city has to offer having visited there myself, um, briefly, but it's still, it's still decent filmmaking in the fact that there's the attempt to actually do it. Yeah. To actually make sure that there's something... That well, there's something he writes the pieces. The... You can tell that he's writing a story that... that yes, this is a universal story, but they're very specific. I mean, look, look at uh, 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 Midnight in Paris. It's right. very specific to Paris. That, and that, you know what that means? And the different the eras of Paris. Exactly. Is, yeah. I mean, that is a, it is literally a love letter to Paris and what Paris means artistically that only that location means, that right. no other location means. And that's kind of interesting. And, and one of the things that I really kind of want, and I, it's just because I'm super excited about the movie, that... Are you super excited? I'm super excited. You ex- are <laughs> super excited. I am really, really excited because we live in South Florida and movies take a few weeks to get here sometimes. I'm very, very excited about Before Midnight because Linklater did such a great job with Before Sunrise and Before Sunset of establishing a location as being the third character in a mm-hmm. film. And this, we're talking about a movie that is predominantly a conversation between two people. <laughs> uh as a matter of fact, I wouldn't even use the word predominantly. It is a conversation it's a, between two people. It's two movies with an entire conversation between two people. And now a third. <laughs> and now a third movie. 
where the location that they're in very it's so so exquisitely done because it it does it so it's not like Woody Allen where it becomes uh, they're doing something or or they're saying something they're referencing or they're they're doing something specific to the city necessarily I know in Before Sunset they ride on the Seine however it's such an aside everything around them that's happening is so Paris but you're so engrossed in the in the conversation you have to watch the movie three or four times to realize that they make their way basically like a quarter yeah. of the way through Paris in the actual movie it's pretty fucking brilliant no and, that, and that's it's, it's and there's so few that do it subtly. There was another one that popped into my head when you were talking about that, which is, it's not a director, but it's mostly a writer, though he's been uh, often directed by Barry Sonnenfeld, which is, um, oh, I'm going to blank on his name, wrote, get short, uh, Elmer Leonard. Elmer Leonard. Elmer Leonard, who basically paint, likes to paint South Florida, uh, specifically Miami, and then also a little bit of Detroit. But he does he does get um, South Florida like a lot, but it's played more on that broad like there's right. a there's a tension drawn to it, which is the difference between what's going on in in the Linklater movies where it is a it's like the it's like the third silent character that's just kind of there that that oh I don't know we're fine sorry iTunes would like to update and uh, I'm just gonna tell it to to fuck off. Right, yeah, I, I think you're right on Elmore, <laughs> Elmore Leonard, though, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the funny thing is, and there are movies I really like, I, and, uh, like, I'm not dismissing movies that I think, you know, miscategorize locations or anything along those lines. I'm not saying they're bad movies at all. Like, for example, I really like, I know you really like the movie Away We Go. I sort of, oh, yeah. you saw it for the first time with us. And that, um, yeah, I know, and that's, and it's something we, and I remember we, we talked about when we first, just, uh, you were telling about this podcast, which is, and we, I think it's it can be an entire other podcast, but that is the road movie, the road trip movie. Right. As right. A we're gonna, the, 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 I think you know, we're going to talk about road trips. I think. Yeah. Road. But I mean, yeah, away we go. Is... But, but they, they're obviously trying to to communicate a different feeling for every location that they go to and visit in the movie. It's almost so brief, and the fact that the movie is also a comedy of sorts, um, I think, lends itself more to caricature. Like when they go to Miami, it's yeah. not Miami. It feels like Miami does almost. It feels like a, a uh, this glamorized version that you would see in a movie that's almost like an action movie. But, yeah, oddly enough, I mean, that, oddly enough, one of the the ones to get my, the the bad the underbelly side of Miami right is is Pain and Gain recently. No, I, I, no absolutely, <laughs> and that's actually one of the things that I thought about when we were when I was just kind of formulating some of my ideas about this is because. Pain and Gain actually really gets Miami right. Like, Miami in that time period, it it is pretty dead on. I'm seeing for, this time period. Say, Miami <laughs> hasn't gotten much nicer. It hasn't true. gotten that much nicer or that much worse, I don't think. Or well, maybe it's gotten worse. I, I just don't know. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, but yeah, that's the, those scuzzy side of things. I mean, you, it, they're often played for laughs when you do it, but I, that's why I like something where you mentioned kind of the, the Sunrise, Sunset, Midnight, that, that trilogy, now, now a trilogy, is that I like those ones where it's a very subtle influence over it versus something where it's you know it really is a character like a full a, a foreground character. Right, absolutely. And I mean, I, I, to you know, reference cross reference on another podcast, I got really excited. I, I, I'm a huge fan of those films, even more so than Linklater altogether. But uh, those films, and because I, I really think that I identify well with. Ethan Hawke and Julie Delpy's writing style, I think, uh, and Linklater. I think the yeah. three of them make this a very nice sort of three-headed writing monster. Well, and they're also growing with the, the they're they're like the adult version of the Potter movies, where these characters are growing every eight to ten years. I mean, when was the first one done? What year? Uh, the first movie? Yeah, two thousand one. That was the first. It's yeah. Been, oh, I thought it was way earlier. No, it was two thousand one. Harry Potter came out a month. No, no, not Potter. I'm talking about the before the Linklater movies. Oh, so, before Sunrise. Yeah, yeah, I thought you said Potter. That's, That's why I'm saying it's like the adult version no, 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 where no, you're no. watching first, a progression. Before, before Sun, before <clears throat> Sunrise came out in '95. Yeah, before <clears throat> Sunset came so out. You're looking at almost 20 years yeah. of a span of writing as these characters, as these actors are growing up and becoming adults. Well, I was, you know, I was listening to this interview with Ethan Hawke, and they were t- reflecting on their performances in the first movie. 
And it was really funny because Hawk said what he thought he was doing then as an actor and as a character was exuding confidence. Mm -hmm. Where now he looks back at it and all he sees from an outside perspective of the character is neuroses. Yeah. Is all he sees is insecurity. Where at the time he thought he was just being like swag, yeah. <laughs> you know, for lack of a better word. I mean, because it really is, it's it's a romantic movie and he gets this woman off of the train and stuff like that. But now he looks back on it and he was like, no, that's not what that was. That was being neurotic and that was being insecure. Then it happened to work in that case, essentially. It was the 90s Woody Allen. <laughs> the 90s neuroses. Well, okay, yeah, kind of, in a, in a way. It was, it was like pre-hipster hipster. <laughs> to bring the hipster back into it. It was hipster before hipster was cool. Anyways, well, so I just thought it was kind of interesting because it it does that whole kind of topic did kind of develop in my head, and I do think it's it's kind of interesting because now we'll watch some movies and they're like, oh, well, the vistas or this part is beautiful or the, this is beautiful, like with Open Range and like two thousand three, they're like they don't make westerns like this anymore where they're really letting the landscapes do the talking, and I'm like, there's something to that, well, especially when a, when a when a filmmaker has the discipline to let that happen. Well, also, and, and I think like it's really important in this discussion to focus on the fact that, and you made a great reference, which is the, the, the Fast and Furious movies, which the, the problem with the Fast and Furious movies is that they are an establishing shot, and then they are a location that is, that's built into whatever the physics of the scene requires, right. but it's not really the same location as the establishing shot. So you've got these, there's this disconnect between, same problem that Nolan had, right, in my opinion, right. which, and I, and I love the, the Dark Knight movies uh, quite a bit, more so than even Ben, but there's that disconnect that you see these shots, you know, these, like, this vista, and you, you have this establishing shot of the city, and then you go into, um, then you're in Pittsburgh. And you know you're shooting in Pittsburgh, right? Exactly. And, yeah. And the, that's not a location. That's locations as a as a like essentially just for for setups. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. I had one, and this is kind of to end it. There's one outlier I've had in the entirety of all of these action movies, the ones that develop these identities and, and try and communicate what cities they're in and what's going on in these cities. There's one specific spy action movie that does it right. Can I guess? Yes. Skyfall. No. Shit. I think Skyfall... All Bond movies are are pretty equally guilty of using them as placeholders. But I like... But see, what Skyfall does... I love does, Skyfall. Skyfall was no, no, my no, no, favorite no, no, movie here's, last year. Here's the thing. What Skyfall does different for me than other Bond movies... You were going to slap is, yourself when I say what it is because you're going to sit... I more that. just want to talk about why I think Skyfall fits okay. into it, which is... Sky, uh, other than their the trip to wh- wherever it is in Asia that they go to that they have the the Komodo dragons yeah, like, and, whatever. And I hate that that tangent. I love the shot in the building before that and that little scene there is great, but the the rest of it is not good. But essentially, that movie is 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 England and Scotland. You essentially you have the city of England, which is a big character as far as what's going on with Silva's plan, all the stuff. You have his island that exists wherever the fuck his island is. But then you've got, and then you have the skills, the, the hills, the, the highlands of Scotland that he goes to for like his origin. I Scot- like that. They, Scotland is the only thing that plays a, 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 feel, a real role to that. In and, that well, and London, I think definitely London. To some extent London, but I'm, I still feel like Scotland is the one that gets the, the love. <laughs> Which, and what that cracked me up is a lot of the critics... We're like, man, it was so boring. The last part of the movie, Bond's all about locations, and they go to Scotland. I was like, that was awesome. Like it was like it totally like took you to this non technical, no interesting vista. The one, the one that I was gonna say that I think really gave the locations that it was shot in life. Howard the Duck, Cleveland. I'm 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 gonna give you a couple hints here. Okay. It's a spy movie. Okay, a spy movie. Born one of the it was movies. co-written by a, a former CIA operative. It was released in '96. It starred Robert De Niro. Ronan. 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 Ronan is very very European, and it's very accurate. It is exact that that film is scary accurate in its depiction of the locations it's actually shot in. Um, it gives the, 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 first off, it's not set anywhere outside of Europe. So it yeah. is all, it's all inclusive, you know, so you have these, you're in different places in Europe, but when you're in the different places in Europe, it, it's so crazy because the car chases in that movie are so 
There are three epic car chases in that movie, yeah. and they are all so different. Just the yeah. way that they're driving is, is incredibly different. Well, and that movie was like a rebirth for that type of cinema. I mean, there, there's no Bourne movies it without Ronan being... It was yeah. the French Connection for the 90s. But yeah, which and we, there hadn't been anything like that, really. I mean, we were still dealing with America as the the kind of focus for any of those right. like big action things and Tom Cruise movies and, and shit like that. But. but anyways, I always thought that Ronan did... For an action film, because uh, even the, just the correspondence and the stuff that's happening real, just off the camera, basically, with the characters and the way that they're communicating with other characters, feels very genuine to the locations that they're actually set in. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that the, 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 uh, how genuine that film is as far as the, the accuracy of the way that things happen is like CIA, CIA or ex-CIA operatives... I think it comes through through the writing and through the direction of that film. It actually does feel like something that's a little bit more genuine than you would in your typical Bond movie or your yeah, yeah. or whatever. So anyways. Definitely. Um, did you have any interesting questions or anything today? Um, questions for you. I don't know why every time I forget to prepare a question I I for you each week, but... Well, well, my, my major oh, question, I've already asked you my question, yeah, yeah. was I wanted to know what was happening in Texas, and I've gotten good enough. Well, how about, um, <laughs> well, my question is, what did you think of the podcast from Texas? What was it like hearing hearing a, another film discussion with a very different type of person? I like it. I think it's interesting. I, I, I mean, I know Hoot, so maybe that's yeah. one of the reasons why I think it's more interesting, too. But I, I can't imagine hearing him and not wanting to hear more. Because remember, there were there were times when you were I could tell you were trying to guide the discussion as an interviewer. Yeah, and I was just like, no, fucking let him talk. Well, let him talk. And like, and, that, and, that, and that, that's what's really funny with this whole podcast is you know we're 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 untested with this right sure, now. Yeah, we're having fun, and we're we're trying to figure out what fit works for us. So I remember I, I called Ben up or I talked to him last week when I was uh, going through the footage that I, ha- that I got out in Texas. And I was like, it's very slow. It's very different than how we go. Where we're like, boom, 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 through topic, right. topic, topic. I'm like, but I was like, I'm fascinated by it. I, and, I like and it. I was just, and I was always caught between, I was, I thought that you would have been like, you should have moved it along faster. And you were the same as me, which is like, I kind of wanted to hear these things play out. And who was in such a different frame of mind that I still am kicking myself that we lost some of the, the, the early footage, although but, we may be, we may be adding some little mini midweek podcast things for you. Uh, all I would like to say in closing <laughs> is that I was right. Oh, I was right about Braveheart. <laughs> I was right. It's that, a love story. <laughs> uh, Hoots, Hoots word is the ultimate word. So there can be no discussion from this point on whether or not Braveheart was a chick flick. What was so eerie is that it wasn't just that he agreed with you, but unprompted, he pretty much used the exact same reasoning you did. He's like, well, there's a lot of other stuff going on there, but predominantly at the foreground of that story, yeah. it's a man and his hide, and he wants to snort her flank, and that's what makes he him do to everything. Snort her flank? <laughs> snort her flank. You didn't hear him say that in there? He uh, uses no, it. Women are either flank or hide, All and when you're snorting of, someone's oh, flank. By the way, <laughs> this is kind of funny. To not uh, just an interesting thing to throw in. So I heard somebody else on not Sports Center on Mike and Mike in the morning quote or reference North Dallas Forty. No shit. No shit. Yeah, on sports shows, they have to. They, they, it was like a, it was a big movie. No. It, well, what happens is I think they were talking about like big moments or whatever in my yeah. and some I think it was Mike Golick actually like Mike and Mike in the morning was like uh, when Nick Nolte quits the team in North Dallas 40 it was a pretty big scene yeah. and everyone's like what is he what is this movie he's talking about it's, well it's like that and The Longest Yard were like two of the biggest football movies in that era they right. were like huge that's yeah. just funny look uh, at that look at that it's just other people validating our existence and our thoughts and now our egos are just going to continue to grow and expand. I don't think that was going to happen Too big anyway. for this podcast. I don't think it was going to happen. Mine was already big. Uh, <laughs> all right. Anyway, folks, we're going to wrap this up here. Um, as I always say, as always, you can find us on our website, www.lastpintprod.com, or on Facebook slash Last Pint, 
or on Twitter at Last Pint Prod. Um, easiest way, just go to the website, click through. We've got posts, we've got uh, uh, blog articles, podcasts, scripts, whatever you want on there. If you want something special, Ben will actually put naked photos of himself up by request. I think I should do one of those downright things where it's like if you write in and you give us like $20 towards the podcast, I'll write you a song and I'll put it on YouTube. They, no, ben will sing a song. All right, here's the deal. All right, then we're going to give like a tiered uh, thing. For 20 bucks, you get a song that Ben will write, which I'm sure will be, you know, mediocre. It'll be a minute and a half fine. long. Yeah. Or About whatever you want. Or if you send in $100, and kids, don't worry, you can pull your money together and do this. Ben will record a video of him singing that song, wearing nothing, but holding the guitar strategically over his man bits and pieces, and he will do that for you. I will do it Forrest Gump style. He, <laughs> this is right, candle I've in the all, wind. I've always <laughs> wanted to be a folk singer. I will be... I find... <laughs> my, my dream has come true. Are you going to put I'm, the wig on? I'm finally, a, I'm finally. She was finally a folk singer, <laughs> and that's and that's definitely. I yeah, I'll do that. If you seriously, a hundred bucks, we'll we will we will make this happen. I will get Ben drunk enough that he's like, yes. I, I he doesn't even have to be drunk, drunk to do this. Are you kidding me? <laughs> they have to think that it's like not something you do normally. So that they pay money for it. Oh, that's the way this <laughs> Oh, no, I don't want to be. Anyways, <laughs> well, as, uh, uh, thanks for listening again this week. Of course, as Matt said, you can find us online. And uh, we'll plan on hearing from you next week where you're going to hear a lot more of Hoot. You're going to hear Hoot and my mom on the in a discussion. And then hopefully, I'm still waiting on it, uh, we will have actual audio from my radio broadcast on Bandera Radio. So anyway, kids, this has been the New Way Podcast with Ben and Matt, and we'll see you next week. Cheers. Cheers.